Welcome to Beyond the Grow, a new Growers Network series hosted by myself. Luke, or some might know me as LMC from a personal YouTube channel, where I discuss cannabis, culture, politics, brands, and much more. In this series, we'll cover the stories and the come-ups of the individuals that have built some of the most successful cannabis businesses in the world. Episode 1, Scott Reach, Rare Dankness. You know, while I've come from more of the sales and marketing side of cannabis in the traditional and now recreational markets, I still have spent my fair share of time working in different grows during harvest or just processing flour in general. And there's very few machines or tools that were consistently in almost all of the grows I worked in. And that, my friends, is Green Bros and their state-of-the-art trimming and harvesting equipment. I'm honored and surprised that one day, that day being today, I would be able to say, this episode was made possible by our friends over at Green Bros. Go check out their website, more on them later. But let's jump back into the main story. What truly makes a person happy? That question has followed Scott Reach throughout his entire journey. Growing up in a small town in Alabama, Scott always saw himself as different. Even though he was a good student and a star athlete, he also liked BMX and still felt kind of like a nerd. And he also loved to smoke weed. His dad wasn't on the picture and his mom worked two to three jobs to support the family. So as the youngest of three, Scott spent a lot of time with his grandparents, following around his grandfather and spending time in the garden. Although Scott's grandfather had a bit of a drinking problem, he was a happy, fun-loving person who Scott credits for instilling a love of plants in him that stuck for life. Together, they would grow tomatoes, strawberries, and many other vegetables. Even though Scott had plenty of friends in high school, he always felt like a bit of an outsider. So in 1993, Scott and his girlfriend at the time, Pamela, who is now his wife, moved to Mobile, Alabama, so he'd go to college. The student loans started piling up, and when they got into a, a bad car accident, they were left with enormous medical bills that forced them to work even harder just to stay afloat financially. This is when he dropped out of school and began working at his first bike shop. He was only making $24,000 a year in Alabama and going deeper into debt. So when he heard about a job at a bike shop in the Hamptons where he could make $75,000 a year plus tips, he jumped at the opportunity. So Scott and Pamela made their way to the state of New York. After a few short days working in the shop and touring the area, he was officially offered a job at the bike shop in the Hamptons. Now, the crazy thing about having his job in the Hamptons was that Scott had customers that were massive celebrities. People like Alec Baldwin, Martha Stewart. He even taught Steven Spielberg's kids how to ride their bikes for $150 an hour and actually ended up on Martha Stewart's show, which Scott calls his short brush with fame. Living in the state of New York exposed Scott to a whole new side of cannabis. He went from smoking brickweed that he and his friends had stolen from their parents back in Alabama to being able to call a number and someone would drive out to the Hamptons with a briefcase full of cannabis and pretty jars and bags bearing different names of strains. He had all the options available in the early 90s. But this cannabis was a bit more expensive. He had to pay $50 for exactly 2.2 grams and to this day still doesn't know why that was the amount you got. If you wanted even more, like an ounce, it could be anywhere from $400 to $600. At this time, Scott was 25. He felt like he was happy, but didn't really know what he wanted in life. He enjoyed working in the bike shop because people were usually in a good mood when they came in the shop, and he loved the mechanical aspect of fixing bikes. As his interest in cannabis grew, he began growing a few plants at a time out in the woods and participating in online cannabis forums like Overgrow. He was able to make connections with growers from all over the world. These forums were anonymous so people could share tips without worrying about the drug laws at the time. Back then, the community had no trolls like the internet does today. It was just a community of like-minded growers helping each other perfect their craft. Scott was able to rise to a leadership position on the site by openly sharing his secrets and techniques as much as he could. Scott and Pamela felt like their lives were finally coming together, so they decided to get married, and in 1995, the couple would take a trip to Amsterdam where they went to the famous Greenhouse Seed Company. There, Scott got a hold of a flyer made by the founder of Greenhouse Seed Company, Arjan Roscom. The main message on the flyer was that if everyone was given access to cannabis seeds, that most likely more people would grow, which would then make people start to see cannabis as just a natural growing plant, and therefore start to erase the stigma around it. The flyer's message resonated with Scott because he knew that growing had been therapeutic for himself. So why couldn't it be for everyone else? 
During his discovery and self-reflection, Scott realized that cannabis was helping him with migraines and other medical issues more effectively than any other treatments he was receiving from doctors. When Scott returned home from Amsterdam, he realized that he may really want to make cannabis his livelihood. The effort he was putting into his grows was increasing and he became much more active on the Overgrow uh, Forum, which was run by a seed company called Heaven Stairway in Canada. This will be important to the story soon. Even though they used VPNs or virtual private networks to protect their identities, he had heard some horror stories of people getting arrested because they made mistakes on the internet, and this scared him. He had heard all sorts of rumors, from small mental lapses like meeting up with someone for a smoke and getting arrested, to fully being manipulated by federal agents and receiving serious jail time. He was prepared to go to prison, but realistically realized that would not be good for him or his family. Even though it was becoming more acceptable, growing cannabis still could send you to prison for 20 years back then. A friend of his in New York got arrested and went to prison for seven years for his grow. So when he heard about someone else in Colorado only getting probation for 40 plants, he began to consider moving. Around this time, Heaven Stairway, the seed company that ran Overgrow, was raided by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and the servers containing everyone's data were seized. This scared the entire Overgrow community, so Scott and Pamela decided to move to Colorado. The move was difficult logistically, as well as financially, but they made it work. Scott had a few potential bike jobs lined up, but unfortunately, due to some promises being broken, those jobs fell through. This was just another part of Scott's journey that shaped the person he is today. Forced to adapt, he had no choice but to focus even more on cannabis, just to make ends meet. He was soon about to see that he had made the right decision because in the year 2000, Amendment 20 passed in Colorado, which allowed doctors to approve patients to grow and consume cannabis. Under Amendment 20, patients would designate someone as a caregiver, allowing that person to grow their cannabis and provide it to them for reimbursement. This is how he continued to operate and it worked well for a while, but as the community grew and more money became involved, he didn't like how people were starting to act. Scott became discouraged as his patients began to contribute less and less to his grow. Scott started questioning what he wanted to do with his life again, and even though he had put years and years into growing cannabis, he decided to switch professions, going back to welding school so he could work as a bike manufacturer. He quickly mastered welding, which he partially attributes to being stoned the entire time, and was well on his way to a successful career. But in 2009, when Obama made it clear that the DEA would not prosecute cannabis operators in medical states, dispensaries began popping up everywhere. It became the full-on wild, wild west, with no taxes and very little regulation. He started taking his home grow into the dispensaries to see what they thought, and got the same response every time. They locked the doors and immediately tried to buy his whole supply for their personal stashes. So Scott got right back into the medical marijuana industry and eventually built a new grow and opened up his own dispensary called Stone Mountain, which was one of the first 50 dispensaries in the state of Colorado. Here he could sell his weed and any extra product the growers in the community couldn't sell. Back then, most people bought their clones from the same companies, so there was not that much diversity amongst the strains Scott's competitors carried. Stone Mountain had unique strains like NL5 and other new hazes, as well as an original Hash Plant 1. Most of the strains we know today have been crossed with each other countless times, but they all come from a limited number that naturally evolved on our planet. These are called land races, and many of the strains found in Stone Mountain were closely related to them. For example, Hash Plant's parents are Afghani and Northern Lights. Northern Lights is a cross between Afghani and Thai. So it was basically a variation on an original Afghani Thai mix. Combining DNA that evolved in separate climates brought different strengths out from both. It increased the levels of THC, terpenes, and other cannabinoids to a point most people in America had not been exposed to before. One day, a medical patient came into Scott's dispensary and told him she had been all over the round the state and finally found, quote, rare dankness referring to the high-quality cannabis Scott had cultivated. This name, Rare Dakeness, rattled around in, in his head for days, and finally he realized the name was perfect for the seed company he wanted to start. He began selling seeds to other growers under that name, and the brand started to grow. Things were going really well, but the stress of opening up the shop and running a semi-illegal business was starting to get to him. Every day he thought, today's the day I'm going to jail. And on top of that, he was throwing up a lot. 
Eventually, a medical patient of his pointed out how sick he looked, so even though he thought it was just from stress, he went to go see the doctor. Everything seemed normal at first, but after running some tests, he was diagnosed with cancer. During his battle, he continued running the shop and breeding every day, not only because it brought him happiness, but because cannabis was the only medicine that truly helped him deal with the pain and the side effects of his cancer treatments. Everything the doctors gave him caused migraines or upset his stomach. This changed his entire outlook on the plant because he realized how important it was for some people's abilities to perform day-to-day -day activities. Amidst all of this, the municipality's dispensary was located in began talking about shutting them down. Even though medical cannabis was legal in Colorado, counties and municipalities had the right to ban dispensaries if they wanted to. So while battling cancer and while running his shop, he would go to every town hall meeting and advocate for himself and his community. But it wasn't good enough and they shut him down. He finally beat cancer at the end of 2010, but was left in a deep depression and he had to start growing as a consultant for other companies after the closure of Stone Mountain. He was being paid by how much he could produce, and he was amazing at his job, so things weren't going too bad. But he was about to get some incredible news. But before we get to that amazing news, I want to highlight the pressure Scott must have been under as a consultant to provide for his family. Literally, the more he grew, the more he got paid. And I think this is where companies like our friends at Green Rose really come in handy. Without the innovative harvesting machines that Green Rose have developed, growers in similar situations to Scott could have lost a lot of money in time. Green Bros has specifically looked at how they can innovate for cannabis cultivators. You can even schedule a free consultation where they will make a custom recommendation based on your needs, from small scale to large scale. The amount of different tools Green Bros offers to help make the harvest run smoother for cultivators is insane. Make sure you go check out their website, greenbros.com. We can't thank our friends over at Green Bros enough for making this episode possible. Scott had put so much work in on his breeding craft during the year he had cancer that in 2011, he actually won the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam for Best Sativa with Moonshine Haze. This was the same competition he had attended as a fan back in 1996, and Scott was the first American to ever win this competition. He had been dreaming of this since he first saw that trophy 15 years earlier, so it was an extremely emotional moment for him. While Scott was celebrating the win, his wife, Pamela, struck while the iron was still hot and started making phone calls to distributors trying to sell Moonshine Hayes seeds. Back then, there weren't nearly as many seed companies as there are now, so by standing out with good customer service and consistently having high quality genetics, they quickly rose to the top of the industry. Timing is extremely important for any entrepreneur, and Scott is a great example of this. He and Pamela capitalized on a moment to build recognition as well as brand and have continuously leveraged that into new opportunities for business growth. In 2013, Scott had another life-changing experience. He was caught in the Colorado floods. These were a series of floods in Colorado that killed eight people and caused over $1 billion in property damage. Boulder County, where Scott was located, was hit the worst, over 17 inches of rain in about five days. For context, they typically get 20 inches per year in this area. Over 1,200 of Scott's neighbors were evacuated by helicopter, but Scott and around 20 other mountain growers stayed behind. They survived in the mountains for 40 days by hiking supplies in and over a two mile break in the highway. Finally, the Army Corps of Engineers were able to build a road for them to get out. Yet another example of Scott's ability to adapt to any given situation and then persevere and overcome that serious roadblock. We're going to turn now to what's being called biblical flooding across Colorado. Residents said they've never seen anything like it. The image is just shocking. Homes up to their roofs with water. Rescuers using canoes to get people to safety as rivers rage with roads ripped out. And there's no end to this misery in sight. ABC News meteorologist Ginger Z is right in the middle of it in Boulder. Good morning, Ginger. While many people that experienced what Scott had to endure for those 40 days would have trouble getting back to a normal life, Scott and Pamela continued to develop and grow the Rare Dankness business and brand. So Rare Dankness was growing fast with Pamela running the logistics side of things and Scott focusing on the breeding. Everything was going smoothly, but he wanted more. So when his consulting contracts were up for negotiation, he turned them all down and began focusing full time 
and rare dignus. Scott wanted to grow for himself. During this time consulting, he noticed that everyone was just building bigger versions of cultivation operations in their garages or basements. No one was utilizing the advanced farming technologies that other agricultural industries used. As he explored the idea of building a state-of-the-art growing facility, he realized that he would need a bigger investor if he was going to take on a project of this size. He had access to plenty of investors, but all of the people who were bringing him deals either wanted part of his brand or too much interest on the loan. It was hard, but he turned them all down. It's important to understand how large a factor this decision was in his success. Even though he had done everything right so far, he could have completely lost control of his ideas or been driven to bankruptcy or both. And if he had still made it to the level of success, someone else would still own a huge piece of his brand. He finally found a reasonable loan and he was off to the races building his new facility. The first two years were an absolute nightmare, but his journey had prepared him for that. And as we've seen, Scott reaches no quitter. After two years of everything from HVAC problems to technical engineering problems, Scott had finally dialed in his SOPs or standard operating procedures and assembled a tight knit team that allowed his facility to reach maximum output. While having a high quality team is essential to achieving goals like reaching maximum output, one of the other major pieces to the puzzle is making sure you have high quality cutting edge technology for harvesting cannabis like the products at Green Rose. Through a commitment to detail, hard work, outstanding customer service, and fine American craftsmanship, Green Bros is proudly helping cultivators of all shapes and sizes realize their own version of the American dream. While Green Bros products helped ease the burden on Scott, the many other challenges Scott faced would sharpen his skills and bring his company to new levels. For example, their highly advanced irrigation system allowed for Scott to test his own nutrients he had been working on for five years. So they started to make their own under rare dakeness, and now it's a whole new part of their company. The trials and tribulations throughout Scott's entire career pushed him to continue improving his craft, and it really shows. His determination and never quit attitude combined with his consistency in the industry over the years made him one of the most prolific growers of our time. His wife still runs the logistics in the office above their dispensary in Denver, and he still works in the grow. They ride to work together and ride home but both run completely opposite ends of the business. He's happy and wants to keep it that way. He's not trying to force his brand into a giant international conglomerate, and he's also not stuck in his ways. Something that I noticed when I was interviewing Scott Reach for this episode is that he comes across as a really humble person. He sent me a video of himself packaging up his own nutrients by himself in his garage. Lately, there's been a shortage in workers, and of course that hasn't stopped Scott. For someone to have reached the heights of success that Scott has and to stay as humble as he is, says something about his character. In conclusion, Scott Reach is someone who continuously kept overcoming hardships, adapting to whichever environment or scenario he may have found himself in. And while sometimes adapting to a new set of circumstances, like being diagnosed with cancer can be extremely hard, he still managed to adapt and keep pushing. And in this world we are all living in, the fundamental rule is adapt to survive. And if you're a cannabis cultivator, small or large, the ability to adapt may very well be determined by the tools and technology you have at your disposal. And if you're lacking in that department, definitely go check out our friends at Green Bros. It makes all the difference. And I wanna thank Green Bros for sponsoring this first episode of Beyond the Grow. And also, thanks to you, the viewer, for watching this first episode. My name is Luke, otherwise known as LMC. Please subscribe to our channel if you are not already and make sure you turn on notifications to stay up to date with all of our content. Also, check out my Instagram and Twitter as well as my personal YouTube. The links will be down below or just search LMC. But anyways, shout out to Scott Reach and the entire team at Rare Dakeness. This is LMC signing out. This customer comes in the store all the way from Grand Junction and he said, you know, Scott, it's really rare to find this type of dankness anywhere in the state. And I looked over at my friend Mark, who was in the store at the time, and I was like, rare dankness, man. Like that, that'd be a good strain name. And it was one of those things that just kind of rattles around in your head. And after two to three weeks, I was like, rare dankness, that's the seed brand. Like that's what we're going to start selling as seeds.